un ex-papier qui se met à terre à Lou, en Singapour, en légendary salon. <coughs> The organizing committee and thank you, Dr. Hayati, uh, for inviting me from Singapore to attend this wonderful meeting in Turkey, Bursa. Wait for my slides. My topic is on uh, UBE fusion. Okay, great. And the technical details and the complications. So just an introduction. I'm. Uh, Practicing in private practice in Singapore, I'm still heavily involved in government practice. I am a visiting consultant of a number of government hospitals to promote and um, to further advance the technology of uh, endoscopic spine surgery. So I do both uh, uniportal and biportal endoscopy, and to address the issue that several times we discussed whether uniportal is better or biportal is better. I encourage you to try and really explore both technology to uh, more uh, simple to complex cases and decide for yourself which is better. So today we will be talking about my disclosure, some of them are relevant to the topic. So today we will be discussing endoscopic fusion. I think endoscopic fusion is uh, uh, based on this graph on the more uh, MIS benefit zone, more on the right side where we actually maximally benefit the patients with more technical, di technically difficult surgeries. So overall, I think there is more and more number of fusions for various reasons. As um, endoscopists, we try our best to not fuse patients, but there are certain indications for fusion as well. And that is uh, taking part in uh, large populations and uh, num large number of surgeries. And we try to perform them better. It's very natural that we will progress to uh, using endoscopy to do fusion and to maximize the benefit of fusion. Through the narrative review, we can understand the chronology from discectomy to stenosis, decompression, and then we went on to do fusion and survival thoracic problems. There are many ways to do endoscopic fusion. Um, we explore through the interlaminar window um, or using a small cage, we can do that with the uniportal interlaminar scope. Or we can use a transforminal approach and uh, again uh, using expandable or, uh, cages or uh, uh, small cages. We can also use the transcamin approach to using small uniportal scopes. With, it, with a large, delta, a large uh, interlaminar scope uh, of a higher diameter, we can actually perform a postulatural approach and UBE use the same approach and UBE also extend more laterally and uh, involve into extreme lateral uh, transformational lumbar interbody fusion. So essentially doing UBE can address from the way from the uh, interlaminar all the way to the transcambine approach depending on how you want to address the, uh, the pathology. So we all know about transcamine fusion. I think the number one criticism, two things. One is small cage, and the uh, second thing is uh, um, exiting nerve root dysesthesia. Of course, there are evolving techniques, expandable cages, as well as uh, more foraminoplasty and courage to decrease these complications. However, one of the issues is still with a uh, small size cage. And uh, subsequently, uh, my mentor and I uh, evolved into describing it uh, using a large uh, endoscope, using the uniportal approach, and uh, we can perform using larger cages, the traditional one that we use in MIST list to perform uh, interbody fusion with one or two cages. Um, and we have extended this to a more uh, uh, resecting the entire facet joint. Uh, we described the anatomy, I think the key anatomy in both uniportal and biportal is to resect the inferior articular process, expose the superior articular process, and then do the decompression of the ligamentum flavor bilaterally or like contralaterally uh, or bilaterally, and then insert the cage by this preparation. Today we focus on UBE. So in UBE fusion, I would like to highlight that the left side approach and the right side approach is slightly different in terms of portal placement. The idea is that 
we need to put uh, on the lateral view, the portals, is placed such that you can uh, insert your cage easily, collinearly, towards the disc. So hence, the, for me, I would like to do the incision in the way that on the left side is slightly above the traditional way we do the decompression and the right side uh, we are uh, slightly below the pedicles as shown on the uh, pictures here. We uh, identify the most uh, lateral part of the interarticular process and uh, that articulates the supraarticular process. I encourage you to release the capsule to see in the literature that we publish, we call that King's Point. And then we uh, move towards identifying the spinal laminar junction, which we are familiar with, and that's most point. And we can use the initial cases, we can use an x ray to confirm those points, and then use a diamond bar to uh, drill across. And that confirms the, more or less the uh, resection point. And after that, we can use the osteotome to perform the osteotomy of the inferior articular process and subsequently we expose the superior articular process this way and then do the resection either through using kerosene or that of the drill or uh, osteotome. And then we prepare the disc and insert the cage. I think one of the advantage of uh, endoscopic fusion is to visualize very well the end plate preparation. And uh, I mean, I was doing initially using, uh, I, I'm, you, we start with using the shavers. And we use the shaver, we shave the medial part, the lateral part, we should gradually increase the size of the shaver. And then, uh, you know, in, in the past when we do open fusion as well as MISTD, and that is probably that's what we all do and uh, after we correct. But when we put in the endoscope, we realize that, uh, personally, we realize we can see that actually the disc space is not so well prepared despite using shaver and current. So we tend to use pen fill to actually remove the last layer and really expose the bone to pump tape bleeding without violation of the end plate so that we can actually put in the cage to uh, uh, enhance fusion. And we can do that uh, using uh, bilaterally because at UBE, we are at the oblique angle, we can do all the way uh, bilaterally, all the way to the contralateral side. So in the UBE fusion, you can actually clear the disc space up to 80%. I think the only part that you are not clearing is the contralateral posterior side, probably 10-20% of the disc that's still left behind. But with, hence, we can do extreme lateral uh, transforming lumbar in the XT lift we call, using large O-lift cages. Um, I know there are modified old lift cages. I have also used Invasive and uh, Medtronic and other companies' large lateral cages that ranges up to 50 mm that can be placed on the uh, XT lift. So, with a good disc preparation that can be done by UBE, you can uh, do actually uh, safely uh, uh, lateral intercordial fusion from the back. So, then finally, we, we insert retractor. Thanks to Dr. Park, uh, we have a transparent retractor. We can actually see the existing nerve root clearly and the uh, traversing nerve root clearly when we insert the cages. Of course, we can also use the metal uh, retractors, which are pretty good, uh, both on the scope as well as uh, getting uh, assistance to retract the nerve root before you place your cage. So these are typical example and the video plays. So uh, the key is uh, first identifying the facet joint. You can, uh, in initial cases, I put them in the fraction. I have a table that can put in the fraction when I decompress and then extend the patient when I put screws. Nowadays, I just put them in the extended position. And uh, we reset the facet joint. Um, when you first do a fusion procedure, you realize that there's a, a significant amount of multifidus muscle that's coming in your way. So uh, they'll be bleeding. So you can you uh, you have to um, very be very precise in your triangulation to minimize the uh, muscle damages. So after we identify that uh, of the area that we are interested to do a uh, fusion, then uh, we'll be uh, marking it with a drill and then using chisel. Using chisel is more for bone harvest. Okay, if you have uh, multi-level decompression and subsequently fusion, and then you have a lot of bone in your hands from your decompression, then it's actually okay to drill 
all the way and then you actually increases your speed. And subsequently, you do a superior articular for the process uh, facetectomy. I think uh, the amount of SAP facetectomy depends on two factors. The adherence of the nerve roots to the disc, uh, depending on if, if the nerve root is very adherent, as, as exiting uh, nerve root, for example, in a, in a lytic spondylolisthesis, please reset all the way the SAP. If it's a degen spondylolisthesis, a grade 1, and then um, the nerve are not very adherent, you can reset 75 to 80% of it, preserve the outer edge of SAP that prevents bleeding. And uh, with that, then we can uh, actually, uh, once you have done that, the ligamentum flavor are loose, and then you can uh, remove it. Depending on the nature of the central stenosis, you can decide whether you uh, would need to do a contralateral decompression. If you need a contralateral decompression, uh, we would perform before the disc exposure, and that is pretty uh, standard. It was covered by multiple talks, so we will skip to just uh, exposing the disc and then uh, performing a dis uh, discectomy and the end plate preparation. So we can use, uh, we call it Indian knife, uh, to, uh, which is quite kind of uh, sharply blunt uh, to dissect safely the disc. There will be periscal vessels uh, that will impede your vision, so do clear them before you perform your discectomy with your shavers, dilators, Curettes and subsequently the last part using the pen fill uh, to uh, really clear the end plate for fusion. Uh, with that, uh, usually you can actually insert very large cages. Uh, depending on the necessity, you can decide whether to use the uh, uh, lordotic bullet or um, even the um, only for uh, lateral cages that we can. Doing, if you like to use the lateral cages, then a full facetectomy is usually necessary and a more oblique approach in placement of the cage. And you need uh, modified equipment to uh, punch the uh, cage horizontally. So after we prepare this, uh, sorry the video was uh, a bit long, but anyway we will be able to insert the cage. It's real time. So anyway we prepare this and then uh, finally put in the bone graft and then insert the cage. So you can see actually we do visualize a large proportion of the um, end plate very well uh, without violation of the end plate. I think that's really the be true benefit of endoscopic fusion. It's not so much about uh, how small the incision, not so much about um, you know whether uh, we can uh, whether the uh, we, because we have fusion anyway, so uh, the muscle musculature preservation. But I think more of like you can actually visualize very well. You are very confident of your plate preparation before you insert a cage with bone graft. So in our study, it shows the fusion uh, results are very good. Uh, in my in our studies, uh, we show that the fusion results are better than the MRST did. We did the MRST did versus. Uh, and also big fusion. Of course, it's a retrospective study. More studies of similar nature is needed before we can conclude those conclusions. So, a uh, few things about this fusion. Um, just some uh, points. Uh, I think one is that uh, we need good radio frequency hemostasis. I think endoscopic fusion particularly bleeds more than that of the interlaminar decompression because. Uh, we are working in a posterolateral window where there is uh, muscles, uh, multipedalous muscles. So uh, we encourage you to use good products that can uh, actually uh, have various type of uh, options okay, to uh, perform the hemostasis. And uh, we have published uh, several results which can, uh, um, by the Koreans and us, and uh, we have uh, done by portal 
uh, fusion in uh, multiple level decompression as well as uh, deformity correction. So this is the oh, we turn sideways, unfortunately. Uh, typical CT scan result. I think due to the concern of time, we will skip that and uh, the X-ray results. Um, personally, I feel that using 3D printed cages has its advantage, but using pig cages, large uh, natural cages, uh, have all shown to have very good result in uh, fusion. I think the preservation of the muscle bulbs are significantly better in uh, endoscopic fusion. In MISTD, we talk, uh, this is a unimortal study, however, we find that uh, in endoscopic fusion, they fuse faster uh, and uh, have a slightly better fusion rate, as well as uh, clinically better than MISTD. So overall, superior uh, entry preparation, which I have highlighted several times, uh, use of uh, either 3D printer or pit cages. Uh, typically, in large or small patients, they are very fair in endoscopy. We use very similar size wound. Doesn't mean that a uh, person is more obese or bigger, they deserve a bigger wound, unlike open surgery, which is the benefit in uh, endoscopic fusion. I think we need more studies. Um, more studies on endoscopic fusion, more people to uh, perform endoscopic fusion so that we have different data from different countries to really highlight uh, differences between the various results. Uh, I have done a study on my own institution. We did, in a year, we did uh, 31 MISTD and endoscopic uh, fusion. Uh, interestingly, I find that uh, uh, timing in lecture endoscopic fusion is better. Of course, uh, maybe. Personally, I've done more endoscopic uh, surgeries. Anyway, uh, in terms of clinical results, they are better in terms of uh, back pain. And more significantly, I think uh, it's less intraoperative blood loss even in MRI compared to MISTDs. And uh, I have not transfused anybody who, until today, up to three level fusion, uh, I have not transfused anyone for endoscopic fusion. And uh, I don't put drain in all my cases. I haven't had a hematoma as well. I think the fact that you have a track to put pedicles through allow the blood to pull out. Of course, good hemostasis during the surgery is important to prevent that. And uh, overall, I think uh, the results are good. Um, the length of hospital stay is really, we count in hours. That's why we don't, they don't stay 33 days, they stay in hours. So the, Typically, they are less than uh, two days stay in our practice. And uh, MISTD, despite being good surgery, they stay a little bit longer, uh, of 80 hours. And uh, overall, I think the benefits are immediate post-op is quite good. And even post-op uh, final outcome, interestingly, uh, my, uh, endoscopic fusion does uh, better, statistically. Of course, uh, clinically, they both are good in terms of results. Okay, let's uh, not uh, bore you all with more of my uh, study. Overall, we are going to publish this data anyway. I think we are interested in complications. I think uh, we would like to highlight a few points. Uh, Dural tear is there in uh, whether endoscopic MIS open, they have a rate of Dural tear. Endoscopic fusion, the Dural tear tends to be managed because they are smaller, uh, usually with tacosyl gel foam, uh, sometimes with speeches. Um, I don't put drain, but uh, for uh, touch wood, no hematoma. I think uh, the track of the pedicle screw allowed the blood to drain out. I think uh, if, uh, like Dr. Malcolm highlighted today, one two days ago, about uh, if the nerve root is closely packed to the disc, sometimes it can cause a one grade uh, weakness. We do have a case. Uh, I think also maybe due to retraction or traversing nerve root. They subsequently improved, thankfully, back to normal. Um, I, I would like to tell, highlight that if you have a patient with a spondylolytic spondylolisthesis of grade 2 and above especially, do a very robust bilateral decompression before you put in cages to reduce it fully because otherwise contralaterally uh, they might tap on the nerve exiting nerve root on contralateral side and hence lead to contralateral pain. Uh, there are cage toxicants despite our good preparation. I have analyzed them and I realized that I use expandable cages in the all or none form. There are some expandable cages that only deploy fully. They don't deploy halfway and stop. 
So those uh, cages, uh, those subsidence occur in both uh, using that cage, and I have ten stock using those uh, all or none expandable cages. That's my own personal experience, my own one practice. So I stopped that, and uh, that subsidence rate has uh, dropped tremendously. So that highlights the point about transformational uh, fusion when we use a lot of expandable cage. We may have to watch out for that. In conclusion, I think uh, in my study we have shown that. Um, it has early recovery, good long-term results, and uh, we can visualize better the disk space and the end plate, and uh, we can be more gentle with the patients. We need a small incision for big patients. We don't need large surgeon, large incision. In fact, everyone, uh, regardless of what we call it in Singapore, regardless of race, language, or religion, same size incision. So uh, larger patients and elderly patients they may benefit more in endoscopic uh, fusion. Thank you very much. So, uh, we, are, uh, we are late. Uh, we will not uh, have questions. So, uh, next speaker is Dr. Arvind. Uh, Arvind. Uh, uh,